Good morning, my name is Chris Fox, and today we're talking about world building. Specifically, how do you build a fictional world from scratch? So let's say you've decided I want to be a science fiction or fantasy author, and I want to create my own world whole cloth out of nothing. I, I want to create something. How do you do that? Well, we're going to provide you a short process to cover the basics. And obviously this is not exhaustive. There are many, many steps to creating a fictional world. But this is going to get the ball rolling and get it started. The very first thing that you want to begin with is ask yourself the, the big question. Are there any physics that are different than Earth? If your planet is twice as large, then your gravity is going to be different. Your day, the length of a day is going to be different. There's going to be all sorts of changes and as you're developing everything, you want to be aware of what those are. What if your planet doesn't spin? So we're thinking about the movie Pitch Black. There's a planet where it doesn't rotate. So one side of it is always dark, one side of it is always light. Think about changes like this. Think about if there are physics that are different than Earth, how they would influence the people that, that live there and how those people might adapt to the challenges that those would create. So as an example, for my own world, I have a fantasy version and a science fiction version. So the science fiction version has already been published. That's the Magitech Chronicles. The fantasy version is called Shattered Gods, but they're the same world. And both of them operate with a premise. Gods do not decay when they die. They are fonts of pure magical power. And so wherever they're killed, they pretty much just stay until somebody consumes them. And this could be another god or any person that comes there can become a mage by taking a bit of this magical power. So for me, if I'm working on Shattered Gods, the fantasy version, I need to ask myself, which of these catalysts exist in my local areas? What powers do they give? And how do those powers influence the local area? So one of my nations is called Hazra, and Hazra has a fire catalyst and a void catalyst. And these two combined together form the greater path of destruction, so they can make battle mages. So that, that really influenced how I developed that nation. I realized they would have a strong military and they'd be able to use you know, this, this magical shock and awe. And that very much influenced how the rest of that kingdom was built. What are your abilities? What are your powers? What are your different physics? Is there more gravity? Is it permanently night? You know, what is different about your world? You can't really proceed until you know that. And it's totally okay, by the way, if there are no differences. If it's just Earth but maybe some people on that planet have magic and it's not really influencing the planet as a whole, that's fine. But you want to answer that question for yourself. Now, once you answer that, the next thing you want to start thinking about is a specific region. So this is what we call in, in software engineering the, the building block approach. You're going to pick one area, probably the area you're most interested in, and you're going to start developing it. And over a very long period of time, you'll go area by area by area and just keep developing different parts of the world and it'll become more interconnected. But you want to start with the first nation you want to work on, the first settlement, if you will. And so what we're doing is we're looking at human history and sort of thinking about how we developed as a species and then replicating that in our own worlds. So what I start with is, is modeling whatever area I'm working on off of a real region. So I will look at a real global map of Earth and start thinking about some of the features of a specific location, like maybe I want to model a part of India or China or Africa and I'll start building a map based off of that real world place and I'll make some tweaks. And the reason for doing this is you can tell a lot about the weather of a place, about the availability of things like water, based on real world maps. Because we can study what actually exists and it tends to replicate itself in the same way. You know, mountains are always going to block clouds on a certain side. So usually one side of mountains is going to be arid and the other side of it is going to be much, much wetter, especially if it's anywhere near a coast. So there's little rules on this on map creation, and we're not going to get into what all of them are in this video, although there will be future videos that will talk about that stuff. But you can start with just picking an area. And I find that it can be really, really easy to look at your local area. So I live currently in Northern California, and I look around and I see redwoods and wine country, and I can go to the mountains and the coast. And so I'm drawing from real world areas. I'm using California when creating parts of my, my fantasy world because I can see what it looks like. I can see what the weather is like and why it is that way. And that's where I start. Now, once you've gotten that far where you, you sort of understand, okay, my physics are a little bit different in this way. And this is the area I'm going to be working on. The first 
question I, I guess you really need to ask as a creator is why would someone have settled that region? So think back to a time when there was no one there. And we can use, you know, Earth as, as an example. Like think about when people first showed up in the New World and we started colonizing the United States. Think about all the reasons why people were coming to the new colonies. They were trying to avoid religious persecution. Some of them were hoping for a better life economically. Think about why people come here. Because your characters in your world are going to have to have very similar reasons. They're trying to escape something or maybe there's resources out there that they're hoping to get access to. And answering that, what type of resources are out there, is going to be important. The most important of those resources are the things that are required for our survival. And there are more of these things, I think, than most people take or understand that exist. We all know, for example, that you need to find shelter. You need to, you know, make clothing. You need to have food. You need to have water. These are basic survival things, right? You might think about weapons. But what a lot of people don't think about is salt. It's not commonly known, and this surprises me a little bit, but every animal requires salt to live. If we go long enough without salt, we will die. And salt is so common on Earth that this is not something that most people deal with today. You can buy salt anywhere, anywhere. It's for sale pretty much everywhere. But that wasn't always the case. And the further back you go, the more of a problem it became. You know, there is a reason why if you go all the way back to ancient Rome, soldiers were paid in salt because salt could be used to preserve food. It was an easy, easily storable currency that they could carry around and measure and weigh. And it had a practical use. They could use it, you know, to, to season their food or to store food for, for long periods of time. So salt was very, very important. When you were trying to kind of plant a location, the things you need to look at is where, where's the water? Where would my people be getting water from? What kind of food are they eating? Are they hunting local game? Is there very rich soil so they can plant crops? If so, what kind of crops are they growing? You know, is it a winery? Are they growing corn? Like what sort of crops would flourish in this area? And then you start sort of extrapolating outwards. Well, who would, who would want these crops? If you have wineries in your area where grapes, you know, are, are really thriving in this really fertile soil, you would find that that wine would be exported almost certainly. As soon as wineries were springing up, they would take that wine back to whatever, wherever people had come from and other neighboring countries would be interested in, in purchasing it. It would become an export. And, and if we're following our winery example, what you would very quickly find is the vinters, the people that ran the wineries would get rich. They would own the wineries and they would own the land. But in order for them to do everything, they would need armies of, of people to work during harvest, to bring those grapes in, you know, and to actually prepare the wine. And so you'd have an underclass of people, many of them, they might be migrant, they might be transient, or they might live locally, but you're going to have workers who probably are not paid very much, and you're going to have rich winery owners. How are these two social groups going to, you know, play out with each other? And what other industries might spring up in our fictional world around wine. What if instead of wine, we've got gold? How would that influence things? Because people don't move to an area just because. They're either, again, trying to escape something and just build a better life, or they're going towards something. Like they want to get something, gold, silver, you know, wine, marble, iron. Something is out there that is of value to them and to society, and they're going to harvest it. So all you have to do is plant a few resources around this area that you're creating and then start extrapolating how that might influence them. Maybe your fictional town has an iron mine. And over time, their smiths get very skilled at making swords and weaponry and they start exporting that stuff. You know, start thinking about if there was a mine, well, what do you need to operate a mine? Start doing a little research. You, you, you probably are going to want coal. You're going to need some forges. You're going to need labor for this stuff. You're going to need horses and or carts or wagons to export the goods that they create other neighboring kingdoms or markets, rather. So really what you're doing is when, when you are building a new world, you're always writing down A leads to B leads to C. So if this resource is here, people are going to come. They're going to begin to extract whatever that resource is, oil, if oil is used in your world, magic. Like if it's my world and it's a catalyst, they're going to settle that catalyst and start creating mages and they're going to want to protect it. So when building a fictional world, these are some of the, the initial questions you need to be aware of. If you've already got an idea of, okay, this is the industries that will spring up around, you know, the resources that are here. And, you know, this is kind of the real world allegory for what I've created. The next thing that you're going to look at is weather. 
Specifically, what challenges do you think are going to, to occur for people? So if, if your setting is in a desert, they're probably not going to see rain very often. Water could be extremely valuable. But if they're in the middle of a jungle, then no one cares about water. And, and maybe there is something that is, is of more worth than them. Um, steel weaponry, because metal can't be found in the jungle. So you're really thinking about where is this location and, and what are the local challenges that people face? And, and weather, again, is where I start. But I mean, you can do plagues, you can do predators. But let's get back to weather. I live in Northern California. So if I was modeling my area that I live in, wildfires would be the number one threat. Now, today we've got the news. If there's a wildfire in the area, I'm going to know well in advance and I can evacuate it. I can get in my car and drive away. It's not super dangerous beyond the fact that maybe, you know, people will lose their homes, which is terrible, obviously. And we've seen a lot of that in Northern California. But if I was setting this in a fantasy world that was based on an area that was very similar, then there probably isn't a means of getting information about fires very quickly. So when a wildfire sweeps through, the local citizens wouldn't know about it until they smelled smoke, saw a flame, you know, they pretty much, it would be upon them before they were aware of it. And so it'd be very, very dangerous. And, and you know, getting away from it would be harder because if there's not some form of magical transportation or cars in your world, like how do you escape a danger like that? So ask yourself, are there earthquakes? Are there tornadoes? You know, are there tsunamis because your, your settlement's on the coast somewhere? What are the natural disasters that will happen? And how will the people react to those natural disasters? What we'll tend to do is, is, as a society, we will modify our society to encompass some of these things. If we know something is a regular threat, we'll have sayings around it. If drought is occurring on a very regular basis, societies will start building cisterns and storing water. And they'll become a water conservationist society where they know that this is a threat. And the conventional wisdom of their society is we need to save water as often as possible. Societies as a whole will adapt to the problems around them. So simply by defining the area, you're going to know these are the resources, these are the threats people have to deal with, and this is how it'll shape their culture. A couple of good examples. If you think about Alaska, I was watching a video online, and as it turns out, there's a law in Alaska that you cannot lock your car. And the reason for this law is polar bears. So there is a video I saw where a guy is coming out of a bar. He's obviously had a few drinks. He's nice and relaxed. He's walking towards his car. And he doesn't make it very far when like a thousand pound polar bear comes after him. And this guy has no chance. There's no way he's going to be able to survive. He runs around a car twice and it's chasing him around this car. And you can see him frantically running for his life. And then on the, the third revolution around this car, he grabs the door and he dives inside. It's not his car, but he grabs inside, you know, the door opens it, dives inside and locks it. And he manages to survive. Well, this guy's survival is directly linked to this law that was created. Well, this law was probably created because lots of people were dealing, you know, with polar bears and dying. Ask yourself the same sorts of questions. If you create a dragon up in, in the hills over your town, how do townsfolk deal with that dragon? Do they make offerings to it? Do they avoid the forest entirely? Do kids grow up wanting to slay it? Do people seek it out for wisdom? You know, does it teach people stuff? So place something in your world. Think about the ramifications and define it. And you're going to do this over and over and over and replicate this for each of your areas. What physics are different? What resources are available? Why and how was this area settled? What challenges are these people facing? If you do that, you're going to get a huge brain dump of information about an area. And from there, you're going to be able to start building offshoots. Because once you've hit a certain critical mass and you understand the basics of an area, the light bulbs really start coming on and you just can't shut the ideas off. So really it is, at least for me, about getting started. That can be very challenging. Start easily. You know, go with the simple what's different about my world. Pick a very small region, mirror something in the real world, start defining it and start thinking about what ifs. You know, what resources are there and how are they being used? Anyway, guys, I hope this video is useful. It's the first world building one I have done in a while, but certainly will not be the last. You're going to see a lot more of this stuff in the near future now that I'm finally getting a chance to write some of my epic fantasy and my epic space fantasy is nearing its conclusion. The seventh book in that series is coming out pretty soon. So I'm, I'm uh, working hard on the last bits of world building for that. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for sticking with me. I need to get back to the writing and I will see you next week.